Sometimes it's the little things in life that we take for granted, like the ability to take our dog for a walk around the block or even open a jar of spaghetti sauce. But patients with autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis can really struggle to get through those daily activities of living. We're gonna talk about how to take care for patients with rheumatoid arthritis today. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Now arthritis we know is inflammation of joint spaces, right? Itis means inflammation, arthro for the joint. Um, rheumatoid is inflammation of those joint spaces. So rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory disease that causes pain in the joints. Let's talk about it. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder where the body's own cells start attacking itself and causing inflammation and swelling in the joint spaces. And we get into this kind of bad vicious cycle where the, um, the body attacks itself, which causes inflammation, and the inflammation causes more attack and can really lead to not only pain and inflammation, but ultimately um, disfigurement and uh, joints not working the way they're supposed to. It only affects about 1% of our population. And like most autoimmune diseases, females are three to one more chance um, to get rheumatoid arthritis than males. Certainly, if you have a first degree relative with rheumatoid arthritis, that puts you at higher risk. Other risk factors can include exposure to cigarette smoke and even some kind of bacterial or viral exposure. Remember, with most autoimmune disorders, uh, genetics plus some trigger is what causes disease. So let's go ahead and talk about the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis happens when the body's um, immune system falsely recognizes its own cells as foreign invaders and starts attacking its own cells, specifically within the joint space. And when this happens, it causes damage in the joint space itself. And an increase of the fluid around the joint that causes impaired movement and pain and ultimately joint deformity. Now, this joint deformity can be found in four stages. First, the body mistakenly attacks its own joint tissue, and then the body starts making antibodies to continue to attack its own tissue, and the joint starts swelling up. Over time, as this attack continues, the joints start to become deformed and bent, and these misshapen joints can press on nerves and not only causing bone pain, but now nerve pain. And ultimately, if not treated or not well managed, the disease will create um, bone fusion where there is no joint space left. It, the bone is just essentially fused in a disfigured position. One defining characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis is that because it is a systemic disease, this typically affects joints symmetrically. So if it's the pinky finger joint on, on the left hand, then the pinky finger joints on the right hand are also going to be involved. If the nef left knee is affected, then the right knee is also going to be affected. And that's one way that you can differentiate rheumatoid arthritis from other arthritis like osteoarthritis. So bilateral symmetrical joints um, are affected. Oftentimes we're gonna see this in the hands and the feet, the knees, the hips, shoulders, elbows, and can even be the jaw uh, joint can be affected. So this is just a zoom in of what that joint space looks like. And you can see the multiple processes that happen due to this inflammatory response that cause joint deformity. So there is an increase in the fluid in the joint space itself called the synovial fluid. The synovial membrane becomes inflamed and enlarged and swollen and tender. And then the cartilage, which typically is works like a bumper cars to keep our bones from grinding on each other. Well, the cartilage gets more thin and broken down so that it's more bone on bone. And then eventually it's causing bone erosion. And in the latest last stages of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, there's so much uh, inflammation here that the bone just kind of fuses together and is completely immo immobile at that point. Typically, patients um, who are diagnosed with this, 
um, if they don't go into remission within their first year, are most likely going to be disabled within 10 years of the onset of this disease. So the uh, joint disfigurement, disfigurement really progresses over time. So how are we going to know how to diagnose someone with rheumatoid arthritis? Well, we're going to look for those signs and symptoms. The first sign and symptom is morning stiffness that lasts longer than 30 minutes. Just really hard time getting those joints moving in the morning. We're going to see a symmetrical joint involvement. Left wrist involved, right wrist involved, you get the idea. And we're also going to see other organs can get involved and we can see systemic um, signs and symptoms involved with rheumatoid arthritis that we wouldn't see in other kinds of arthralgias. Ultimately, also, we're going to see this irreversible joint damage and disability that happens over time. Now, there are some specific uh, types of joint deformities that are common with rheumatoid arthritis, especially as it comes to the hands. We can see this boutonniere's deformity where the finger is kind of held up in the joint and it gets disfigured that way. Uh, we can see the swan neck deformity um, that also is, is very characteristic of a deformity of rheumatoid arthritis. Or we can see this ulnar deviation that happens um, kind of pushing the hand out to the side. In addition, we can see rheumatoid nodules where this the joint itself will become swollen just around the joint and um, feel you can feel and palpate the nodule there. So these are some of those common joint deformities specific to rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, let's talk about testing and diagnostics for rheumatoid arthritis. Now in terms of um, diagnosis, we're gonna look for those signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. By uh, bilateral symmetrical joint involvement, morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes, and seeing some um, other organs involved or some, some systemic reactions, um, things like kidney disease, um, generalized fatigue, malaise, um, can all be indicators of rheumatoid arthritis. In terms of lab studies, we're going to look for those nonspecific inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein or ESR. Um, we can look for some specific rheumatic factors, uh, rheumatoid factor, ANA titer, and anticyclic citrullinated peptides, um, which can all indicate rheumatoid arthritis, but are not definitive in and of themselves. Now, before starting a patient with rheumatoid arthritis on a DMARD or a biologic, we're going to want to check them for tuberculosis. Um, or uh, hepatitis to make sure they don't have any latent infections that could become active after they start these medications. Now, in terms of radiographs, x-rays are going to be important to look for the severity of uh, uh, joint damage and in joint involvement, but really MRIs and ultrasounds can be more specific although more expensive. So patients will oftentimes have a combination of those different radiographic studies to follow the progression of their disease over time. So when a patient has rheumatoid arthritis, remember there is no cure for this autoimmune disorder. So it's really about um, how do we prevent flare up? How do we um, hopefully get this patient into remission and um, prevent them from getting additional joint deformity over time, or at least slow the progression? So um, gentle range of motion exercises are encouraged. Light aerobic exercise is also encouraged to help move those joints and physical and occupational therapies can help. In terms of medications, there's four drug categories we typically consider. Uh, steroids, analgesics, anti-inflammatories, and DMARDs, as well as some of those biologics that we can talk about as well. But for today, I'd like to specifically talk about DMARDs. Now, DMARDs are short for disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. It's a category of drugs that have come on the market specific to rheumatoid arthritis, and all of them in different ways interfere with that immune response where the body is attacking itself. And so if we can kind of stop that response from happening, we can slow or stop the progression of these disease. I do wanna talk about a few specifics um, as we consider DMARDs. So some examples of DMARD medications would be methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfasalazine. And all of these are gonna alter the immune system in some way to reduce inflammation and therefore reduce joint damage. Now, because um, the 
when the patient takes these medications, it could um, activate a latent infection that the patient has in their body. We wanna make sure we test them for hepatitis and tuberculosis before starting these drugs. And let's talk a little bit about methotrexate as an example of these medications. So methotrexate is taken weekly. Um, we monitor carefully for hepatotoxicity. And if they take it with folic acid, it can help reduce some of those side effects like oral ulcers that can occur. Um, the methotrexate is teratogenic, uh, meaning that it can cause um, significant uh, birth deformities. And so patients on methotrexate should not uh, get pregnant. In fact, when I worked in the ER, if a patient had a tubal, a tubal ligation where um, the embryo was lodged up in the fallopian tube instead of the uterus, which is not sustainable for life, we would actually administer methotrexate um, to uh, spontaneously abort that um, the embryo from the fallopian tube. And so it really is a very potent drug um, for embryos and fetuses, which is why we don't want patients to be taking this um, if they're pregnant. And then because um, this is metabolized by the renal system, we would use a lower dose for patients with renal insufficiency because they're not going to excrete it as fast. Surgical management for rheumatoid arthritis can include joint replacements when those joints are just so damaged that they're so painful and, and really um, lack any mobility in those or patients may have bone fusion, which is not gonna help with range of motion, but can relieve pain, especially when it gets to the point where it's just bone on bone in those joint spaces. Now complications of rheumatoid arthritis can include decreased function, and again, um, the possibility of permanent disability and permanent joint uh, deformity. Um, it can include infection because these patients are so busy fighting their own cells that they really have a hard time fighting off foreign invaders like actual infections. Um, and the medications that they're on also cause immunosuppression. And cancer is also a complication of rheumatoid arthritis. As always, let's talk about the nursing process, ADPI, as it pertains to taking care of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. So in terms of assessment, um, we're going to look for signs and symptoms, especially as they relate to pain or loss of function and mobility. We're also going to look for any side effects from the pharmacologic agents that they're on, knowing that they're taking some pretty heavy hitting drugs um, to help manage this disorder. In terms of nursing diagnoses, remember when we're diagnosing a nursing diagnosis, it's identifying problems that the patient has that we can have an impact on. So um, nursing diagnoses for rheumatoid arthritis would include pain, ineffective sleep patterns related to discomfort, and a self-care deficit as those joint deformities, especially in the hands, can cause activities of daily living to be very difficult. Okay, as always, when we talk about nursing interventions, we're going to talk about what assessments to do, what actions to take, and what teaching to give. So in terms of assessments for a patient who already has rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to assess their joint pain and their ability to get around. Do they need any uh, assistive devices? We're going to assess their vital signs, including their temperature. We're going to look at their lab studies, CBC, uh, liver enzymes, and we're going to look at renal drug, renal um, studies and looking at their inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and ESR. And then we're going to look for any of those extra articular manifestations. Now, extra articular manifestations means outside of the bone. And so um, there are other things that can impact, that can manifest outside of the joint spaces in rheumatoid arthritis because it is a systemic disorder. So patients can have other clinical manifestations like osteopenia, which means lack of bone density, brittle bones, uh, muscle weakness. Um, a scleritis, which can um, be eye pain and inflammation, pleuritis, which means inflammation of the, the pleural lining of the lungs, uh, 
and pericarditis, which can be um, inflammation of the sac surrounding the heart. So we can see other symptoms like shortness of breath and chest pain, eye pain, um, a variety of symptoms outside of the joint spaces that patients with rheumatoid arthritis can have. And what actions are we gonna take? Well, of course, we're gonna administer um, medications as ordered, especially pain medications, anti-inflammatory medications, steroids to help reduce inflammation, DMARDs and biologics as ordered to hopefully slow or stop the progression of the disease and the deformity. And now in terms of nursing and, and teaching that we're gonna do, um, we're going to talk about the importance of adhering to a treatment plan. Uh, this is a chronic condition and patients need to um, monitor it carefully and consistently to prevent joint deformity. They're going to report any signs and symptoms of infection since they are immunosuppressed. Uh, we're going to teach them about, you know, proper hand hygiene, avoiding crowds, wearing masks, avoiding being around sick people, um, keeping up with their vaccinations. We're going to assist with referrals. Again, people with chronic conditions are going to need a lot of specialists on their team. Um, PT, OT, support groups, having an infectious disease specialist and a rheumatologist. And there's some lifestyle changes that we can encourage patients um, to follow, like eating well, controlling stress, exercise, massage, heat and cold, um, and improving their sleep. So how do we know we do a good job with these patients who um, have rheumatoid arthritis? What do we, when can we say, yes, this patient is doing well? Well, um, hopefully that we see a patient with few to no tender swollen joints, um, minimal morning stiffness, and also not having adverse side effects to these really heavy pharmacologic drugs. So if we can see a patient who feels pretty good, is able to move around, do activities of daily living, um, get up and moving in the day, and not having all those nasty side effects from the medications, then we're in pretty good shape. That's going to wrap it up for our chat on rheumatoid arthritis. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 